in Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11 is where we're at. We're looking at the life of Jesus, and we've parked it on a really cool prayer. Luke chapter 11. Now, it's familiar to us because we have gone through this once before, because this is the second time that Jesus taught them how to pray. Now, it's cool doing this study that we're doing, the life of Jesus, because we're discovering things. Here's something that we're discovering, that this prayer is taught twice, one up in the area of the Galilee, up around, um, you know, Capernaum and that, this one down in Judea near Jerusalem. And so two different locations, but the same teaching, the same prayer. And so they came to him again, they were watching him pray, and the disciples came to him and said, teach us to pray. And he said this, when you pray, and then we've walked through part of this. Remember now, this is a, this is a prayer that is an outline prayer. It's not something, and we talked a lot about this, because don't misunderstand this. This is not just something to, to rattle off, turn your brain off, and you're just going to rattle this off. Our Father out in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You just rattle this thing off. That's absolutely what he told us not to do when he taught this before. Not through vain repetition. So what this is, is an outline prayer. And as we learn to pray through this prayer, God teaches us to pray. As we start off walking through this and really stopping and thinking about what it says. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So we started right there. Our Father. Remember, our collectively. We talked about that word our. It's translated in our Bibles, our collectively. It's also translated as personally. That's a, that's a great word for right there. If I was going to write a Bible, I would put that word there. Because perfect. Because it means all of us, our, together. We're never alone in this Christian faith. We need one another. We need to be supporting one another. Praying for one another. Okay? Not, not trying to, to, to undermine one another. Man, the Christian church is filled with, with just stupidity. We need to be loving one another and helping one another. Lord, help us with that. So it's our, collectively, but it's also personal. He is my Father. He's my father. And again, we've already walked all the way through this, this portion of it. He's, uh, he's my father. I have a personal relationship with the God that created me. And that right there will cause you to just to pause and to worship. Thank you, God. And then, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed, praise your name. It's honor. Your name is, is something to be revered. Hallowed be thy name. We talked a little bit about the, the names of God. And we did that in depth when we taught this before the names of God. And then we camped out on this one, and this is a good, good bridge to what we want to talk about today. He, it says, your kingdom come, and then he says, your will be done. I want the will of God in my life. I hear so much, uh, well, I'm looking for God's will. What is God's will for me? Oh, I think this is the will of God. What is, how do we find the will of God? What is the will of God for us? Well, I think these two go together. I believe this is an order. Um, absolutely believe. But it starts off, your kingdom come. When we understand that first, the will of God becomes pretty simple. Pretty simple, yeah, just think about this. I want, first of all, your kingdom to come. Now, we talked last time about your kingdom to come. Do you understand what that means? The second coming of Jesus, he could come back right now. And we talked about that. We are believers in the, in the second coming of Jesus, and it really does mean that any moment, at any time, he could appear. This could all be over like that in a moment. And we had to live that way. This could be our last moment. Lord, help us to, to, to run this race well with endurance all the way to the end. Thy kingdom come. But also thy kingdom come in my life. So it's personal also. Thy kingdom come in my life. Now guys, if you don't hear anything else, you need to hear this. Because this is life changing when you get this. It took me years to understand this particular concept. Though I, I see it in the Bible, but when you really get it, and it's this, it's so basic, it's this. There really is two kingdoms. There really is a kingdom of me, and I'm on the throne of my life, and there's the kingdom of God is on the throne, and it's all his. I want to tell you, this right here is life-changing when you learn this principle. It's all the way through the word, and when you start looking for this, and you understand it, you start seeing it all the way through the word. You hear things like this. Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. He will either hate 
the one and love the other, or else you'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money, mammon. He would say, he who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters abroad. You're either for him or against him, and we understand that. But we understand that it really is two kingdoms. It's two kings. Listen, it's two completely different world views. You can relax in that. I understand that it's, it's, it's God's hand. It's God's, everything is God's. It's not mine. So I can relax in some of those things. You know how freeing this is? Well, what about this? I don't know, that's God's problem. That's God's issue. He has called us to be faithful. He's called us to live in integrity. You cannot read the Bible without understanding that. But when you understand that, that it's all in God's hands, it's not in my hands, it's in God's hands. It's all God's stuff, it's not my stuff. I don't stress over tithing or giving or any of those things, because it's not mine, it's his. And when it's, when it's asked, you know, 10%, it's so funny, the church is just funny, it's so predictable. Whenever we talk about tithing, immediately, man, it gets quiet in here. Well, he just wants our money. I don't want your money. I want you to see the two kingdoms. I want you to see the kingdom of God. With the kingdom of God, it's all God's. I want to do everything I can to further the kingdom. If giving a birthday away means that there's people that there's life's going to be changed, because it's not just a cow or a chicken or a water system. We know because of the groups that we work with, we know that the gospel's going to go out. This doesn't go here, be warm, be filled, be gone. It's not that at all. It's here. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about what he's done. Let me tell you why we do these things. And that's what it's all about. But it's when, it's, when you understand, because we can't get to the, can't even understand the will of God in our life unless we understand that it's fully his. I am not, I am not an owner of anything. I am a steward. I'm a steward of all the God's trust. We just, was it yesterday? Yesterday, just, or was it or Friday? Man, it just blurs, it blends together around here. As you get older, it just happens, doesn't it? I think it was yesterday, we had a funeral. And, uh, and we do a lot of those here. As we get older as a church, we're graduating more and more saints. And it's, we had a funeral here yesterday, and the body was here, up here in the front, and uh, she's not there. That's a shell. And she took nothing with her except that relationship with Christ and, and who she really is. But none of those things. May, is it going to take then that we're going to understand that we were simply stewards of all things and not really owners? You know, you own your house. Well, probably three of you in this room own your house. The bank owns all the rest of it. All right. And they would like you to get out as soon as possible. All right. So, but you own, you have this paper. I own this. You don't own that. When you die, somebody else will, will own that. You own nothing. We're only just passing through. And I've got to tell you this. This is freeing when you understand this. It, but you have to be a good steward over all those things. This is all put into my care that I am to do well with what God has entrusted to me, knowing that it's not mine. And if God requires it or, need, or there's, some, there's some way to bless or further the kingdom, then I want to give it away because it's not mine. Again, guys, don't let this just be head. And that, this, that doesn't help. It really helps when we catch it in our hearts. Really, this is it, is that it is all God's. I can totally trust in God. So this, this terrible thing happens to you, and you start stressing and striving. You know what? You're freaking out, and you don't need to freak out because it's in God's hands. Can you change one thing by worrying about it? Can you change one thing by striving and stressing? No, you're giving yourself ulcers. I know ulcers. I had bleeding ulcers years ago. I didn't know about these things. Oh, it's just got to be so. It's just got to, oh, it's not mine. It's God's. So when we talk about the will of God, I'm going to quickly run through some things that are just basic. We need to be reminded of these things. But the first and foremost thing that we need to understand is that when we talk about, I want the will of God in my life. We're talking about the will of God. It's this. It's not my life. I'm a steward over everything he's entrusted to me. It's not my direction, it's his direction. It, it's, it's all in his hands. Now, I am called, and we'll see it here in just a little bit, I am called to be faithful. 
I am called to, to walk in integrity. Don't miss that point. Well, it's just all God, so we just, whatever. God can just take care of that. I'm going to be over here doing this thing. Uh, no. No. Well, I can do anything I like because it's all God's. Yes, you can, but here's the cool thing. God changes, totally changes the things that you like. Now I like hanging out with you guys, with God's people. I love reading the Bible. He changes my likes. I don't like getting stoned anymore. It was a bad scene last night. I just don't like it. <laughs> Processing that one. No, that was, a, that's just, <laughs> I didn't see if you're listening, all right? No, I don't do that stuff anymore. I don't need that stuff anymore. Oh. My Bible reads this way. Jesus looked at the, those that were following him. He says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Take up your cross daily, meaning it's not always going to be easy. Sometimes it's going to be difficult. The Bible talks about when the Apostle Paul was talking to Timothy. He said, he said train yourself towards godliness holy sweat. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's a training process. And yet as we go, there's joy in the journey. And it's not mine. There's such a, it's, it's different now because now I don't have to stress or strive over outcomes of things because it's God, it's in God's hands. But I do need to be faithful to continue to press towards what God has called me to do. And understand this. Again, I'm going to go through some quick points here is this is that God has promised us. God has promised us that he would guide us. He's promised us, I want to know the will of God. Well, here's the first part of it, is that God has promised us he's going to guide us. It was, it was Saul of Tarsus. He's against us Christians, and, and uh, he's on the road to Damascus. You know the story, Acts chapter 9. And he's going there to, to, to he's going to arrest Christians and put them to death. That's his goal. And he gets slapped to the ground by God. I don't know if he was on a horse or not. I heard somebody the other day talking about how he got knocked from his mount. I don't know if he was on a horse or not. I just know the Bible says he was on his way to, to Damascus to arrest Christians. Jesus showed up, the glorified Jesus showed up. Up and boom, knocked him to the ground. You know, what are you doing, Saul? What are you doing? It's hard to kick against the goads. I've always marveled at that because even in this hatred that, that Saul had for the Christians, God still loved him. Jesus still, it's, you're hurting yourself doing this, aren't you? Kick against the goads means that a goad was a, a sharp stick that you could, you know, goad something along. It was a sharp stick that if the animal would kick up, you'd, you'd poke it with this stick. Sometimes it was attached to the cart so to teach him not to kick. A goad was something, a sharp stick that brought you pain when you fought against it. And what he was saying is, is that's hurting, isn't it? That's bringing you pain, isn't it? You don't have to do that. And then Saul said this, be mindful of this. He said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And, and for the rest of his life, God guided him. And you see a great example of that. I want you now to go. I want you to go into Damascus. You'll be told what to do. Just do A. After you do A, then I'll show you what B is. And life is just like that being a Christian. I want you to do, what do I want you to do? So your heart got stirred in, in some kind of thing that was there. Okay, so I want you to be part of the prison ministry. And I just talked about that. And, and oh, you had that little tugging. Lord, is that you? Lord, I really want to know your will. What is this? And you begin to move in that direction. And watch God as he, as you do A, watch what happens to the B and the C and the D. And watch the journey you begin to get on. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his ways. Psalm 32 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eyes. Psalm 32. I'm going to instruct you. I'm going to guide you. But you're going to have to trust in me in this. And you begin to walk and you begin to trust in him. What an awesome thing this is. I understand this too. It's not, we, I hear people say this, well, the Bible is our roadmap. Well, that's true. The problem with this roadmap is it's telling us how to go. It tells us where the end direction is, but it doesn't tell us the twists and turns in our personal life. And I like that. It's a roadmap, but I see it differently. I see it as more of a relationship. 
because I don't see the next turn. I just talked to somebody before the service and I made some flippant comment as I often do. And sometimes I feel really bad that I said that. And, uh, but uh, it just came to mind. He was saying, I don't remember what he was saying. But I, I said, uh, I said, you know, one day will make a big difference. You know, one day. One day could change our lives. One little, one little chest pain could change our life. One bone, I mean, just, I mean, not to be so morbid, but, but things, it doesn't, it, it, we come here sometimes at the church and, and we got our plan, what we're going to do for the day. And sometimes, boom, everything gets disrailed because something happened. Get a phone call. And the, the, the person that is there at the scene of the accident goes to our church. The person that is there in the street that has passed away goes to our church. That changed the day. That changed, that changed a month for us. How quickly things can change. So I look to this and God, you gotta walk me through this. I don't know what this day holds. You gotta walk me through this. So the roadmap, oh, it's just, you know, if, if you come to Jesus, everything's just rosy and everything's, no, you come to Jesus, there's still pain and there's still difficulty. You better hold on to him. Because sometimes there's, there's parts in the road that you don't see coming. Also this, God's will. He didn't come into this life to make you miserable. I'm not so sure I want God's will. He might send me to Africa. Don't send me to Africa, God. Now some of you want to go to Africa, all right? And some of you, we want to go to Africa, all right? <laughs> One way ticket, all right? But uh, no, but... Delight in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. God did not come into this, this world to make you miserable. He came to give you life. And so when I'm saying, I want God's will, how do I find God's will? You don't have to be afraid of it. You don't have to be afraid of what God's going to lead you down. Again, it's going to be step-by-step -step process, but you don't have to be afraid of that. Lord, here am I, send me. I had no idea, I had no idea he was gonna send me to Salt Lake City. I didn't wanna go to Salt Lake City. I had no desire to come here. I did not wanna come here, all right? And that's a, but God began step by step by step and saying, yes, you do want this. No, I don't. Yes, you do. No, I don't. And I ended up here and I praise God, there's no other place I'd rather be now. And he knew exactly what was the best, but, but he didn't tell me up front. And he don't tell us up front many times the direction and where he wants to put you because you might fight against it. You'll be like Jonah. You jump in the boat going the opposite direction. Look over, the, look over into the water. There's a shadow in the water. You know what that is? A big stinking whale, big fish. I don't know if it's a whale or not. The Bible says a big fish getting ready to suck you up. You will follow God. Well, I don't know if that's how God operates, but he does operate this way. When you follow him, he gives you the desires of your heart and some things you don't even know that are there. I do know this. I do believe this of Christians that are fo you're following God. I do believe every single one of us want our lives to count for the gospel. I believe that because God's placed that in us. I believe every one of us want to leave that legacy uh, of that we've done well, that we get at the end of this thing we've done well. I believe that. I don't believe there's anyone, and maybe you're the exception of this, change this. But I believe if we follow Christ, I don't believe we get to the end of this thing going, well, that was good, mediocre life. I did absolutely nothing with my life. In fact, I pissed off 100 people. I did good. I did good. You know, I don't think any of us want to live that way. And some of you get to the end of your life, and that's what, that's what happens. I've done a lot of funerals. And sometimes I see such bitterness in a room. You know, and we all talk lies about the person that just passed away and when it's that situation, you know. But it's just, but then I see others that are so much love and so much joy. What is the wake? Look behind your life. What is the wake that you're leaving? Is it a wake of, of love and, and yeah, there's, there's bumps and there's things that happen. But look behind in your life. Look, look where you're at right now. Look behind you and, and where you've come from and what you've done. What's behind you? Is it, is it broken relationships and, 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 and a, big, a big mess? Oh, there's some good things, but is it, is it mostly messes behind you? Then it's time to change direction, my friend, because you're not, you, you continue down this road and you keep making bigger messes. Fix that. Well, how do I know your will? How do I know your will? Well, here's, first of all, the no-brainer. He gave us his Bible. He gave us the word. 
And over and over again, when you begin to study this thing, 1 Thessalonians, for this is the will of God. Okay, that's a good verse. What does it say? Your sanctification. That you should abstain from sexual immorality. That's the will of God. He goes on to say, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You start reading the Bible, you start saying, I want to know your will. It's in here. It's in. Let me show you one that, that, that got us last week. In 1 Peter chapter 2. Look over at 1 Peter chapter 2. I want to know your will, God. Well, you come to give me life and that more abundantly. You promised that you would guide me in this life, so I'm going to trust in that. So how do I know your will? First of all, again, he's given us his Bible. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as an evildoer, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. So all the way through the New Testament, you find this, of this is how you're supposed to live. Abstain from sexual immorality. You're pilgrims, you're sojourning here. Therefore, and I'm going I'm to highlight this in just a minute. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to the governor's, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. Now look at this. For this is the will of God, that, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. It says it's free, yet not using liberty as a, as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Yeah, honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. And on it goes. The Bible reads like this all over the place. What is the will of God? Well, he just, he's just laying these things out, that we're to live in integrity. We're to love people. I mean, we go through this. If, if, if the Christian church would do what the Bible says, the Christian church would do what the Bible says, we'd change the world. And yet this is what got me. This is what got me. And this is because I struggle with this is this, it says, we, we, and you, you, some of the staff was here when we were looking at this, submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to, as the king, uh, as supreme, or to the governors, to the president, to the governor, to, because, and it just says this, you know, submit yourself to them, honor them. I said, you know, in the Christian church, we don't do this stuff very well. We don't do this very well. The more I go through what it says here, the less and less political I become, and the more, the more gospel-oriented I become. What, are they separate? Yeah, the more I get into politics, the less I'm talking about Jesus. And the more hatred comes out, and the more anger comes out. It does. The thing is this, is that we know more about our, our, the sitcoms that are on television. We know more about the sports things. We know more about those things than we know about the Bible. And you've been saved a long time. What if, what if it was constantly, you are focusing your heart on the things of the Word of God. You'd be, I, think, I absolutely believe this. It would change us. It would change our views. I want the will of God for my life. It is not something that hides from us. It is something right in front of our face. As you begin to read this, you begin to see what the will of God is. The will of God is for us to love one another. The will of God is not for you to be great. I've got to do this great thing so people look at me. That is not the gospel. We want everybody to look at Jesus because he's the one that can help and change people. So many times I hear, well, I gotta, I gotta know the will of God. I gotta have the, it's so self-focused and so self-centered that God is nowhere around in that. I've gotta do this because I'm great, I'm mighty. I'm gonna go do this great thing for God. Well, go do it, but shut up. <laughs> go do great things for God, but stop talking about you because it's not you. You are a dirt clod, all right? All right, you are. <laughs> yeah, wash your clothes and stuff, all right? You just, well, let's leave it alone, all right? <laughs> but I say this, what is the will of God? What, how do we know God's will? Thy, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He had us pray that. So you gotta stop there. What is your will, God? And he says, I told you. 
over and over again. And you read it on Sunday. You read it occasionally on Wednesday. You pick it up occasionally during the week. And you read it and you're still asking me? It's right here in this book. It's right here in this book. Yeah, but you're not telling me if I should move to Arkansas or not. And that's the will I want to know. Is that your will? Cool. Because now I give you the Holy Spirit. I give you the Holy Spirit that's going to guide and direct you. I give you the Holy Spirit that's that because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Again, John 16, he says, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you of things to come. First Corinthians six, he says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? and you are not your own. Second Timothy chapter one, again, it goes on and on. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. We have someone that's gonna guide us through this life. We have the word of God that we need to be all involved with. We need to know what this book says. We need to follow God. But then the Holy Spirit, as we begin to, God, what do I do here? And he'll open doors and close doors. He'll give you the conviction. He'll, gi he'll give you things. You just know. There's times you just know that ain't right. And I have this thing that's helped a lot. I wish I'd have obeyed it a lot more. Is this, is that when in doubt, just don't. When in doubt, just, just kind of wait. I don't know about this. I'm not talking about a little nervousness. About, but when it feels, this just doesn't feel right. This is not something I'm supposed to do. So, but it's not that so I'm just going to sit here and I'm never going to serve until I feel right. No, it doesn't work that way. But there's times, and you can tell the difference when you're following God. There, there's a difference. There's times you just know, I need to wait on this. This is something I would like to do. Sometimes he gives us spouses to help slow us down. There's a one point. Things were pretty rough, and, and uh, there were some opportunities to, to go out. And I told my wife, I said, you know, uh, I think that... Uh, I think that Australia would really be a good place for a church plant. What do you think of that? And this was years ago. And she goes, it ain't happened in Paco. <laughs> I go, really? <laughs> really? And you're the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yes, I wasn't listening to the Holy Spirit. It's amazing how the Holy Spirit sounds like my wife a lot. <laughs> you know? Don't tell her that, though. She gets all big-headed. You know? that's, not, that's not true. But the thing is this, is that he will guide us through the Holy Spirit. He gave us the Bible. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He gave us an awesome thing called prayer to talk to him. The Bible says in, in James chapter 1, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally without reproach, for it will be given to him. Sometimes it's like, I don't know what to, to do here, God. And God says, if you lack wisdom, hello, I live in that place of lacking wisdom. I lack wisdom. So God, I'm going to ask you, what do I need to do here? I'm going to wait upon you. I'm not going to, you know, if we wanted to push something, we could have, we could have destroyed this church by moving. We could have pushed and pushed and pushed and moved over to the uh, fun dome over there, or the, ga the, what, the gallery or whatever, right up the street there. We could have pushed and we could have buried ourselves financially. And we could have done that. We could have, we could have laid off half the staff. We could have, we could have buried this church financially so we can have a better place aboard. We could have a better presence in this town and all those things. And I understand some of that. We could have killed ourselves. God protected us to not go down those roads. And we lacked wisdom. I praise God we didn't move when we weren't supposed to. And it was, a, it was one of those prayers, Lord, we don't know what to do here. We're going to wait upon you. That's a hard one. And Lord, if you want to open this door, then we're going to look to you. And he opens the doors. The Bible says he opens the door that no man can shut. And he shuts the door that no man can open. So I trust him in that. God, you're gonna, I, I gotta look to you, God. You've got a guide in directing this. I'm just gonna pause and go real slow here because if I go down the wrong path, I can hurt some people. Maybe you ought to do that before you start having lustful thoughts towards that person at work. Maybe you ought to slow way down and pray about that before you go there because you'll never go there. Maybe I slow that way down and pray about that before you go put it on the credit card or before you go do this or that. I mean, whatever, fill in the blank. Maybe you ought to slow that way down before you go in a direction that you're going to regret for a very long time. Slow it down. Let God, as he begins to, it's, it, I don't know if I can trust him in this. 
Is that what you're saying by not waiting upon him? I don't know if this is really God's direction. What are you saying when you just take it, on, take it in your own direction? No, it's, he's come to give us life and that more abundantly. So he gives us his word, gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us connection in prayer. No, don't neglect this one too. How do I know the will of God? He gives us the advice of godly people. Sometimes you need that. The Proverbs 12 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who is wise heeds counsel. Proverbs 15, without counsel, plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors, are, things are established. They are established. Sometimes it's just you gotta bounce it off of someone. Sometimes you just need to have someone that doesn't have an agenda, but has a heart for you and for the word of God. So you go to them, and sometimes it's good. Say, man, let me, let me bounce this off you. Let me, let's talk about this. I have good friends. I have a lot of good friends that, that I bounce things off of all the time. My wife is one I bounce almost everything off of. You know, hey, what do you think about this? And we talk about those things. And, then, and you ought to have sort of friends that way. I have friends. Sometimes I'll call friends. and I have friends here in the, in the staff. I'll say, what do you think about this? Yeah, that's dumb. Yeah, you probably shouldn't do that. Yeah, that's not right. And that's good to have friends that will say that to you. Or maybe you ought to consider this. Or Pastor John, hmm. <laughs> and he walks away. What is that? Hmm, I don't know what that means, but it probably means I ought to think about that again. Get out of here, you know. Smart man right there. So sometimes you need to bow. What is God's will? And here's the thing is that I had a friend that, that, uh, We'd go around and ask everybody, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? And kind of take a vote. And, and then until he got the vote of what he wanted to do anyways. Let me tell you where this guy ended up. Here's a guy that was absolutely had a call of God on his life. Absolutely was being used in a very radical way by God. And I saw this kid. I, I look back at this kid. I look at him and go, you know what? You're going you're gonna to be a great pastor one day. Because he had the love. He had the integrity. had all these things. But he took everything to a vote end up taking things to a vote so much that he voted himself out of ministry. He's completely out of ministry now, seeking a total secular field. And, um, you know, whatever, that's his life. I can't, I just look back and go, you know what? It could have been something great in the kingdom of God. And now it's just, you know, because we voted. We voted. What's, what do you think? Because sometimes, sometimes God's vote is bigger than, than all those things. I, you know, I wouldn't, be in, I wouldn't be in Salt Lake City if, if I would have took a vote. I got good counselors and I got good people around me that prayed for me and had people like John and others that kicked me out of Sacramento, all right? And I had, I had some of that. Uh, but I had lots of people, lots of families saying, what are you doing? You going to Salt Lake City and, and what? You might have a job. You might have these things. You don't know one person in Salt Lake City and you're going there to do what? Start a church in the middle of the, the Mormons? What are you thinking? I'm not thinking. Exactly! That's the problem right there. I don't know. I cried a lot, but I can't get away from it. Because God is clear. And we're going anyway. And then here's this. This, this fits right into this. Is that God opens. What is your will, God? Yes, there's the Bible. Yes, there's prayer. Yes, there's the Holy Spirit. Yes, there's counselor. But God also opens the door. He also brings opportunity. So I come to Salt Lake City. And I'm here, and we're just coming through Salt Lake City, because I'm going to Greeley, Colorado to plant a church, not here, right? And if I'd have known, I'd have probably went around Salt Lake City, okay? <laughs> but I come through here, and we're in this little, little store down here, and, uh, and this gal starts talking to me. You know, don't talk to me. I don't want to talk to you right now. And she starts talking to me, and she starts saying, you know what? We've been praying for a church here, a church plant, and, and uh, really, get away from me. <laughs> I'm going to Colorado, you know? I have story after story after story where God, God made it so clear that there was a fact when I got to Colorado, I got to Colorado, there was a, there was a door that was, that was shutting there, you know, though we could have started a church. There was already a, a, a Bible study that was already meeting and there's a church. The cool thing is, is that right after I left, a church was planted. It's a healthy church now. God didn't need me to do that. He needed me to come through Salt Lake City. And that's the way to get me through here was to he heading, towards, heading towards Denver, heading towards to Greeley and, and that whole area up there. He needed to get me through here. Sneaky sometimes, God, sneaky <laughs> gets through here. Lots of big stories. But God opened the door. 
God brought opportunity, brought, brought circumstances in those things. But again, I do, now, 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 if I took that and just says, well, that's the thing that I know God's will. Without the others, you'll mess up. But, when that, but that is one, it's like a, like a big puzzle. That's one of the puzzle pieces that just, it began to fit. It's like, yeah, I read the Bible, and he's telling me that I'm going to go to make disciples. And it's really clear in his word that I'm supposed to make my life count. All right, he's there. So he gives me the drive, and, and he says he's going to go with me. He gave me the Holy Spirit, and I can't shake this Salt Lake City thing. I can't shake that. And I begin to pray, and, and God makes it clear. Every time I pray, it's clear that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Well, you're going to have to do a whole bunch more than that, God. I mean, really. i got a house to sell. I don't have a job here. I don't know anybody here. And I got a wife that don't know about this right now. And she's, she wants to go there. I got a whole list of things that you're going to have to, you're going to have to do. You talk to God like that? Why not? Why not have that relationship with him? You're going to have to help me with this. Boom, 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 boom. He checked every one of those things off the list. I went, oh, crap. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? I guess we're going. You know? Everything, every single line. Did you just say crap, Brother Bulba? Yeah. It's in the Bible. They use the word dung, you know. <laughs> you, know? you see what God does is he begins to open the door that no man can close. And he closes the door that if we do kick that door open, you'll be, you'll, you'll be sorry. You'll mess up. What is God's will for my life? What is God's will, first of all, First of all, is it, is it your kingdom that you're trying to build? Is it you that want to be seen? Is it you that are trying to be built up? Well, then forget about God's will yet because you're not even on that page yet. Until you get to this page, say, God, it's got to be all you. It's got to be you and not me. It's got to be you. So is it, what kingdom is it? Is it his kingdom or is it your kingdom you're trying to build up? All right, so you got that established. Now, God, what is the will for my life? All right, here's your first, here's point, very first thing. Get in his word. Be a person of integrity. Be a person of the Bible. Be a person that knows this book. All right? It, it, everything else just starts lining up. What is your will? What is your will? God, is it for me to do this or do that? Go slow. Let God be God. God will guide your steps. God's a big God. We're little. He's so big and so strong. He can open doors and close doors. He can guide us. He can give us that peace. He can give us that nervousness. Yeah, that's all part of it. Ah, this is a little scary, Lord. I'm literally, if we're being called, I didn't want to be called in the ministry at all. At all. I physically sit on the front row and physically shake. Not because I'm, I don't care what people think about me, but, but I do care. I do care that I don't mess this thing up because God's a big God and I, it's a scary thing to mess God's word up. Sit on the front row and I don't want to do this. I don't like people and, and I, I get up there and God just shows up. God just shows up. If I'd have never done the A, he'd have never start seeing the B, where you start seeing a person getting saved, things happening, and God moving. You gotta do the A first. For some of you, it's time to, to back up and just start living in integrity first. Clean house. Stop being a wasteful life of a Christian. Clean house. Some of you, this, none of this stuff, we're, we're, down, we're down here with what kingdom are you all about first, because we're talking about the will of God, how to follow the will of God. None of that stuff applies to, to you unless you get that first part done. I gotta have integrity in my life where I'm following God and I'm trusting in Him. Does that mean you're perfect? No, we blow it, we mess up. But we know where to go when we do. We know how to deal with it and we do deal with it when we, when we mess up. So what are you gonna do? So quit saying, I want the will of God, this great, grander thing, so everybody can see me and look how great I am. Hallelujah, I'm the great so-and-so. No, you're a dingbat, all right? And you're, you're someone that gives Christianity a bad name. How about this? I want to serve God and love the people and follow him step by step. The Bible says things like this, leave a quiet and peaceably life. Promotion doesn't come from the east or the west. Promotion comes from the Lord. He raises up one, he puts down another. It's God that does it over and over. As you again get in the word, you start realizing it's not about self-promotion. It's not about how great I am. It's not about me doing great things for God. It's me in a generation 
showing that there is a great God that loves people. And so you remove the me out of that and remove it all about him. It's all about Jesus. Sir, we would see Jesus on the pulpit. You're entering your mission field. Every time you turn around this church, we're going to put it in your face. It's about Jesus, not about you. You are dirt clod for Jesus. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for playing. All right. If you're looking for good self-esteem, you're not going to find it except in him esteem. And then you're going to be more than conquerors.